authorities on Africa, clearly established by a, a career of accomplishment. He glanced at the resume of his, which I was holding, and asked me, please don't read that whole thing. And, uh, and the only reason he would say that <clears throat> is that it's extraordinarily long. Uh, it's dense. Um, everything uh, in it is meaningful. Uh, the number of his significant publications are many. And uh, to have read it would have taken a long time, but it wouldn't have been a wasted uh, summary of an extraordinary career. Professor Zartman got his master's degree from Johns Hopkins University in 1952. Uh, he received a, uh, I think what I'm being told is that this may help, but isn't this enough at the present time? No. Sandy, you you just can't hear at all. Not, not what I'm saying, all right. Okay, does that help? Well, one has to get very, very close to this microphone, Professor Zartman, and I'm going to leave this hand mic here as well, so you have, uh, you have choices, neither of which are very good. <laughs> And his PhD is from Yale in International Studies. Uh, he's uh, uh, had a distinguished teaching career. Uh, he was at uh, South Carolina and NYU. He's lectured at perhaps uh, 14 different universities around the world, including Oxford and Hebrew University and others of enormous reputation. And his writings, which are numerous, have included African politics, especially the politics of Northern Africa, over a half a dozen books in that area. And he's published on uh, African relations. And then perhaps most significant is his uh, enormous work on conflict uh, uh, resolution. I happened to talk to an Africanist today who referred to uh, Professor Zartman is the guru of conflict resolution. And indeed, he has written on it extensively. He's been one of the architects of oriented the Institute of Peace in that direction. Uh, he has prepared courses of that kind for the Foreign Service Institute. He's helped with their publishing uh, program in that area. And he has uh, uh, edited uh, the series that Johns Hopkins is working on in the area of negotiation. So his contributions in that particular field have been numerous, uh, his own work as well as that that he's encouraged in others, and uh, the way that he's oriented institutions. I hope that's a sufficient summary of what is a very long list of impressive, impressive works. But to get on with the, uh, the uh, substance of the evening, it's my enormous pleasure to present to you uh, Professor William Zartman. I don't know whether to rely on this mechanism or to talk like I talk in classes. I don't know, can people hear me? Or should I lean over this and eat it up? Okay. I'd like to, sh uh, to thank the mayor and the former mayor for arranging an African-like climate uh, for us this evening so that you'd kind of be in the mood. Uh, my wife and I just came back from Senegal. Uh, Senegal has two seasons, the hot season and the hotter season. When we were there in the height of the hotter season, the temperature was higher than the humidity. The humidity was higher than the temperature. They both came gushing out of the top of the thermometer. And uh, somehow it wasn't as bad to us, awful, as it was as to other people around. Uh, and people said, well, what, what's going on? Why can you stand it? And we said, well, we come from Maryland. <laughs> I'd like to talk uh, on the topic that's been announced, African conflicts and, and American responses, talk a little bit about the, the general situation in Africa uh, today as the background. I'd hope for perhaps more specific questions afterward, and I'd like to leave some, some time for, for questions. I'll do my best. I'm used to talking in two hour, teaching in two hour modules, so I'll try to keep myself under control. <laughs> 
Africa is associated in our minds with conflict, uh, and there is conflict all around as we look at uh, African countries and we look at the phenomenon of collapsed states, uh, states that actually disappear as far as their legitimate authority is concerned. We see more cases in Africa than we do in other continents, although it's not an African phenomenon by itself. When we look at ethnic conflicts, people doing each other in, in large numbers because of who they are, because they're of some other identifiable group. We find a large number of these in, uh, in Africa. Conflict is what we associate very frequently uh, with the African continent. In fact, uh, there are not more internal conflicts today than there were in past decades in numbers, uh, but there are more relatively. That is that interstate conflicts have gone down with the end of the Cold War, leaving intrastate internal conflict uh, as a dominant uh, form of conflict in, in international relations. And though, so this dominates our, our attention. And even when we have conflicts that we see in the newspapers that have been uh, regulated, taken care of in Mozambique or in Angola or the conflict in South Africa. Uh, in many cases, they still remain. They hang on, as in, in, in Angola or, or in uh, Rwanda today, after we thought that that situation had been resolved. And then other conflicts arise. Uh, if you like to do betting on African futures, keep an eye on places like Congo, the other Congo, Congo Brazzaville, or the Central African Republic or Kenya or Cameroon, names that are not in the uh, headlines as yet today, but uh, are likely to be in the future by the same kind of, of nature of their conflict. Well, why do we have these kind of conflicts in regard to Africa? Uh, why do they break out? And then what should be our appropriate response? Do they matter to us? And what can we do about it? I think we can say that there are uh, at least three reasons why conflict breaks out at the present time uh, in Africa during the 90s in the post-Cold War period. And the first has to do with the end of the Cold War. The end of the Cold War means that there's a breakdown in a sense of international order. Although we're all relieved to see the balance of terror over, uh, the Cold War had a certain assurance to us. We knew who our enemies were. Uh, we knew what the shape of the world was. It was the free world and the communist world and perhaps a, a non-aligned part of the free world in between, in between that traded with the rest of the free world. But we, we knew what the world looked like. Today that's gone. Uh, and as you may have noticed from our foreign policy in general or from our ability to discuss events in the world, uh, there is no accepted sense of what the world order is at the present time. There is no dominant way in which we can talk about uh, the shape of the world, the North, the South, the, uh, the uh, NATO and non-NATO. None of these are, are, uh, uh, are overwhelming, are global, are overarching ways of talking about uh, the world. And this has made a tremendous impact on a place as distant from the global conflict as Africa for a number of reasons. First of all, it has meant the end of restraint. Uh, it, uh, it's odd to think about it in this way, but many of the conflicts in Africa uh, were African, all of the conflicts in Africa uh, before the, the 90s were African in origin, but very frequently abetted by the Cold War powers, by the United States and the Soviet Union. So we fed arms to our side, lest their side get an advantage. But then we also kept these under some kind of control. So there was a, a certain restraint, a certain balance in the conflicts that, the, that went on. And that restraint is now gone. There is no Soviet Union to deal with. There is nobody to rein in uh, particular parties in an African conflict. Uh, there is no our side and their side. And yet the major element of conducting the conflict is still present in spades. Africa is awash in arms. It's a wash in arms that the Cold War gave to its parties, believing that it could control the use of those arms. Uh, and now there's no restraint. 
In addition, the sense of order is gone, as I've just mentioned, but it has transferred itself into the African continent. Uh, so there is a disappearance uh, of a sense of international order, even within the African continent. Uh, and that means that new orders have to be worked out. Parties have to see uh, who's their friend and who's their enemy, since that is not imposed on them, and they complained about it before in that imposition, but it's no longer imposed on them from the outside. And so they have to look warily at their neighbor uh, and see in what terms they relate to their, to their neighbor uh, and how to work out their own sense of order. Disorder then in interstate relations becomes endemic because disorder, the lack of order, is characteristic of our round world today. Even further, uh, the, there's a lack of restraint from a bygone system of world order, that is from the colonial era. Uh, the colonial era ended in the post-war era and African states achieved their independence, but they maintained some kind of special relationship with the former colonial powers. Uh, and uh, it, it was a relationship of, of knowledge, of familiarity, of using language, of, of using ideas with the major cause of grievance between the colonizer, the metropole, and the colonial power disappeared now that independence was present. And so frequently, in many cases, and particularly in a special group of cases, African states had a special relationship that maintained with their colonial powers, particularly in regard to the French-speaking African states. France remained a distant balancer, restrainer, player when necessary in the African field. But time has gone on and people who went to school with French leaders and, and then became leaders of their own country uh, have now passed on, been replaced by succession, by military coups, by other generations, by people who are much further from the metropole. And so the French presence, the French restraint, just like the Cold War restraint, is, uh, restraint, is being withdrawn from the African continent. It is no longer welcome. It can no longer come in with a small group of tr a small number of troops and uh, bring order back to a conflicting situation. We've seen recently in the Central African Republic uh, that uh, the, the French troops came in for a, on a number of occasions to try to settle a, a dispute between a mutinous army and a, a government that had been elected. Uh, and finally, both sides said, "Get out. Uh, we want to enjoy our conflict together." Uh, and the same thing is true uh, in, we enjoy our conflicts. We enjoyed, uh, the, the Cold War gave us too, but we on the global level, a sense of who we are and a sense of purpose. Uh, more than we like to say we enjoy conflicts and African states uh, uh, go through the same attitudes towards their conflicts. In Congo, the other Congo, in Brazzaville, Congo Brazzaville, uh, a, where an election is, is coming up, uh, the two leaders of the country are tearing the country apart uh, uh, and reject the influence, the influence of the former colonial power to keep their uh, conflict under control. So there's a breakdown of international order and its effects on African conflict. But in addition, and we did it, we did this breakdown. We won the Cold War. And so we destroyed that sense of order and we destroyed with it the, the effects of the Cold War order. And we're happy we did it. This is not a criticism, but it has implications. The second effect, the second reason why we have conflict in, in Africa uh, it deals with the breakdown of domestic order uh, as well. The, the order established by new and fragile states that were set up after independence and now are some 30 years old going on 40 years. Um, and if you look back in American history when nobody was troubling us very much uh, and count from 70, 1776, you can see uh, about the, the fragility of the American system and some of the problems that we had uh, in our own domestic order during the youth of our republic. Uh, domestic order in Africa is breaking down for reasons that we are largely responsible for as well. Sounds strange. 
But the reason why domestic order is breaking down is that it was characteristically based on a single party system, an established leader, uh, sometimes a succession of leaders, uh, in which power was controlled in the center in all different ways. A scarcely a totalitarian system, although that, that sounds very totalitarian, uh, its inefficiency, the underdevelopment of the country kept it from being totalitarian, but political power, economic power was concentrated in the hands of the state. Um, and this was legitimized by the fact that uh, in the East as well as the West, we accepted the single party system as an African nation party. It incarnated the nation. Division would be ethnic and tribal, and division therefore was uh, not a national effect, uh, nation, not a nation building eff uh, effect. Uh, and in addition, the economy was centralized in the hands of the government because that's where available capital was. There were not enough capitalists, people who could in, uh, invest private capital in the economy. And so that had to be, uh, the economy had to be in the, under the control of the government. And then we came with the Cold War, with, after the Cold War, with two highly subversive ideas. One of them was democracy. And that means dividing up the population into different camps and having them debate with each other over uh, who should be in power and over the future direction of the, of the government. In other words, challenging that single party uh, over, uh, about its dominance over the life of the, of the nation. Uh, and proposing that the opposition party had as much a right to people's, uh, people's votes and allegiance as the single party. And then we came in with another idea called structural adjustment. We felt that people should not be spending more than they took in. <laughs> that states should not be uh, involved in deficit spending, printing money, uh, and in wasteful government dominated uh, centrally so called planned uh, economies. And that meant that the state was no longer was deprived of the, the ability to be the provider for its population. It no longer could take all the graduates of the, of the universities, and they're, they're, uh, that was a percentage of the population, and guarantee them jobs. It could no longer uh, provide benefits for all of the population uh, because of its control over the national economy. And that meant, too, that, 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 that people then lost their sense of allegiance to, to the state, looked for other ways of carrying out politics, uh, and the order, the centralized domestic order, broke down. And we did it. We did it for two good reasons. There's nothing questionable in what I'm saying about, in what I'm suggesting about democracy, or about the fact that you could only spend money that you take in. Uh, most of us try to live that way. Uh, but it does mean that uh, when one brings in these ideas, one shakes the established patterns of government that had been set up and cautioned under the Cold War. Uh, this provided a number of problems within uh, Africa. First of all, it provided for a power vacuum. It created a power vacuum within the states. Uh, instead of being a centralized dominating power, states uh, economically and politically found themselves, state authorities found themselves contested. As they went then to democratic organization, they went out to, fi to find troops, to find voters, uh, that were uh, that had some allegiance to them, and they were thrown back on uh, ethnic ties, on family ties. It is not the rise of ethnicity that has created a breakdown of order in Africa. It is the breakdown of order that has sent people running to ethnic ties in order to find their uh, their followers. If you run to ethnic ties, this then leads to another phenomenon that we have called by the name of the security dilemma. That is a situation in which the more I try to make myself secure, identified in ethnic terms, in ascriptive terms by whom I am, by who I am, uh, the more I make another party insecure. 
And then he tries to make himself more secure. And this security dilemma, this spiral continues. If I live in a neighborhood that's a mixed neighborhood, um, and incidentally, uh, this is the same phenomenon as we see going on, uh, that has been going on over the same period uh, in Bosnia uh, under similar conditions, a breakdown of order and so on. If I live in a mixed neighborhood um, and I'm told that the others are organizing to protect themselves, um, even though the others are my friends, um, I, I want to make sure that I get together with my people to organize to protect myself. Um, and then if the others do something uh, because they see that I'm organizing to protect myself, then uh, I want to do something too, uh, which may mean moving them out, it, it may mean intimidating them a bit. Uh, this is the security dilemma, and it has a powerful effect. It turns normal people into savages based on ethnic criteria. And remember, I'm not just talking about Africa, although that's my topic. I'm talking about a European country that is uh, Yugoslavia, and I'm talking about a phenomenon that can go on in uh, many parts of the, of the world. When this situation occurs in that condition of arms that are available throughout the country, uh, then uh, one has the ingredients of ethnic conflict uh, that uh, can tear countries apart. There's a third phenomenon, too, that's involved in, this, uh, in the rise of violence, and that is the presence of egregious rulers. By egregious rulers, I don't mean simply bad rulers. I mean people who, who privatize government who privatize all the resources of the state to pull them into their pocket, who do politics for themselves and consider that the benefit, uh, consider that the apparatus of the state is their own private uh, affair. I'm thinking about people like Mobutu, the late Joseph Desiree Mobutu, Mobutu Sisi Seko, uh, who turned uh, Zaire, Congo, uh, into his own private estate and whose uh, personal fortune was something like the GDP of the country that he, he ruled. And he took it out of the country and invested it in some places and put it in some banks. Uh, but he's not alone. Uh, I'm taking, thinking of people like Siad Barre of, uh, of Somalia. Uh, or I'm thinking of people who are now still in power, like uh, Bia in Cameroon or Moy uh, in Kenya, uh, people whom we will hear about uh, more in the future. This, too, we were somewhat responsible for because many of these people, we or our opponent, uh, or both in the case of Siad Barre, uh, found convenient as allies during the Cold War period. Uh, and that, too, was a natural kind of policy. We deal with states. The United States is not in the subversion business. Uh, it deals with states, with rulers in power. Um, and uh, therefore, if the ruler stays in power for a while, that's the kind of person that, that's the person that we have to deal with. But in that process, uh, the relations under the Cold War, when it was difficult to rock the boat, uh, kept in power some people who were beyond the pale of simply, beyond the description of simply uh, normally bad rulers. When these people go, it's not just a succession. It's not just a question of somebody else moving into uh, the particular palace. When these people go, they carry with them. They have created around themselves a political vacuum by destroying all political life that's not under their control. And they have uh, created around themselves a little group of people who depend entirely on them. Uh, when Ahmadou Ahidjo tried to re or resigned uh, in Cameroon and passed on the power to, to Bia, uh, Bia at one point after some difficulties wanted to resign and the rest of his barons said, hey, you're not leaving because we all depend on you uh, and we're going to help you stay in power. Uh, that's the system and the vacuum around them was created even further. The egregious ruler uh, creates a uh, concentration of power that leaves a vacuum uh, when he leaves. So all of these are conditions that I think we can see came out of the previous world. Uh, and uh, Africa being a policy taker, 
uh, being not in a position to dominate its environment, uh, it had to undergo the effects of the world uh, in which it lived. Um, after, after Africa, uh, after the Cold War ended, uh, a number of changes came across the African continent. Uh, two waves of political change. First of all, as I've just suggested, was the wave of democratization in the early 90s. Um, and there have been some, uh, some 30 out of the 50 African states which have undergone, which have held at least one election and sometimes two uh, since in the 90s, since 1990. Uh, many of them free and fair, many of them stable, uh, many of them creating a transition to uh, the kind of government that our beliefs tell us a body politic, a population, a civil society ought to be able to take into their hands. Uh, some of them have not. Uh, some of them have uh, had this election procedure overthrown, have uh, uh, reverted to old ways, or have reverted to the phenomenon I talked about, about ethnic conflict. In these states, and this is the good side of the picture, power is legitimized, as it is in our country, by elections, by the periodic voice of the people, and people are held accountable for what they did during their term of office. Uh, and uh, the process continues, providing a, uh, a guarantee that the egregious ruler phenomenon uh, is not going to take place. Because there is no concentration, there is no political vacuum. A good case is the little country of Benin, uh, where the awful dictator, Mathieu Karikou, was tossed out by people gathering together in 1990 to take sovereignty in their hands. Civil society said, uh, we are sovereign, you're not. You're just president, and yet you're soon ex-president. Uh, and we were, we're going to reconstitute the system, an extraordinary exercise, uh, similar to moments in our own uh, early history. And uh, elections were held, and a successor was, uh, was voted in. He didn't do very well. Uh, and although he put into effect some ideas of structural adjustment and, and democratization, his time came up for account accountability. Meanwhile, Matthew Kerikou underwent a change of faith and uh, a reformation, and in the next elections last year, uh, he uh, presented himself as a candidate against the incumbent president, and he won, uh, and he's doing better than he did before. Uh, an interesting case of accountability, of the effect it can even have uh, on somebody who led a system to ruin in an earlier period. There's a second wave that's going on at the present time, and this is what one might call a wave of the new authoritarianism. It's sometimes referred to as the new generation of rulers. People who, wh whose only way of getting to power in the situation that I've described was to lead a long struggle um, one might call it a revolution, uh, and we, we could debate about that. Revolutions are associated usually with larger countries, China and France and maybe the United States and Russia and so on. But uh, it, it was a thoroughgoing overhaul of the system that involved uh, violence, uh, involved a protracted struggle, and therefore involved pulling together the followers of the, of the leader, uh, both into an organization organized group um, and around a cause uh, that was centered on, on changing the conditions that had existed under the, the previous uh, government. Um, these new authoritarian rulers then claim, uh, as did the earlier generation in the 1960s, that they represent the real nation and that the earlier rulers had hijacked the idea of nationalism. They're legitimized by a long armed struggle. Uh, and by a revolutionary type of uh, approach to the restructuring of, of government. They're fiercely nationalist. They want to do it themselves. And one of their parts of their revolution is to, to, to be on their own, rather than dependent uh, either on the former colonial power or on the Cold War uh, countries. Um, it, many of them have made very important changes. 
uh, particularly in the economic field, so that many of these countries are, uh, have embarked on a structural adjustment program that involves privatizing, that involves ridding the state of these uh, wasteful parastatals, that it involves uh, an austerity program, uh, and uh, pulling back into the resources, into better spending of the limited resources that the, uh, the state has. Some of these, as well, have uh, turned to the adoption of elections in some form, uh, usually uh, with a dominant party, uh, turning the revolutionary legitimization uh, into a legitimization by uh, popular votes. Uh, although in all of the cases, all of this, uh, this new authoritarian group or the new elite, in all of the cases, elections have returned to power the, 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 uh, the incumbent. Um, elections do that sometimes, and so I, I think uh, sometimes in, in our foreign policy we say the only legitimate elections are the elections as in Benin, which provide alternates, that is, bring in the opposition. But elections can perfectly well uh, be free and fair and bring the incumbent back into to power. Why, we have that phenomenon here in the United States, well, we even have it in Maryland, I believe. <laughs> One thing is lacking, though, in this group. Uh, of states, a group, by the way, that includes such states as Mozambique and Angola and Ghana with Jerry Rawlings and Zimbabwe, Uganda, Ethiopia, Eritrea, Rwanda, Liberia recently, um, and uh, Zaire, Congo. One thing is lacking, uh, and that is a real test of accountability in many cases, probably in most cases, barring the exceptions that I, I just mentioned. That is something that keeps these rulers from being, from turning in as time goes on to the egregious ruler phenomenon that we've seen before. So that uh, many of these people are uh, darlings of the West, darlings of the World Bank, people like Museveni uh, in, Ugan in uh, Uganda or Rawlings in, in Ghana, um, and both of them have had elections of some kind. Rawlings had a fully contested election, which he happened to win. Um, but uh, what is needed is the uh, exercise of democracy to keep the rulers clean. What should be United States policy in this kind of, of situation? First of all, I think it's important to note that United States responsibility is engaged. We, the situation that we see in Africa uh, has important roots in the end of the Cold War and in the structural adjustment and democratization policies that we preach and lead and uh, urge on countries throughout the world. It's not happening just somewhere else. We are involved in basic causes. Second of all, when conflicts occur, when a new order or attempts to build it break down, the United States can't keep out of conflict. You might call it the CNN effect, and that term has frequently been used. But the CNN effect refers to basic values that we hold. That is, that we think that there's something wrong when lots of people get killed. We don't feel that we can stay out of it uh, when a conflict is going on, even in a distant part of the United uh, of the world. We're sometimes criticized for being slow and reacting, but I think it's important to emphasize the other side, that we do react, and we can't stay out. Uh, and so uh, it's better to take measures uh, that prevent this from happening. And the third reason, as a continuation of the second, is that engagement now is cheaper, more effective, than engagement in times of crisis. Uh, if one can do something to help improve governance uh, in newly established systems, uh, to return patterns of order within Africa, uh, then we are buying an insurance policy against much more wasteful spending of money and endangering to our own lives because there's a, uh, there's a need for somebody to get involved directly uh, at a time when conflict breaks out. The United States 
Europe as well, need to engage diplomatically and economically with countries like the Congo and other important countries, not every country, but other important states in the group to assist the state building process and to press for a democratization or a, democrat a democratizing course. Democratization is not an immediate but an eventual necessity. And the record of pressure that we have on some states, such as Kenya and, and uh, Cameroon and Ghana, shows that pressures for democratization can be successful. But the goal is not to take place necessarily immediately. The alternative <coughs> guarantees the immediate and prolonged existence of an authoritarian regime, and in some cases, the return of anarchy. Building effective, responsible states based on political and economic accountability should be the main thrust of Western policy in Africa. The outcome is worth the investment, since such states are the only ones likely to be sound political and economic interlocutors with the West, open to trade and investment, and open to collaboration on political goals. And that's what we want out of other states uh, with us in the world. These are positive justifications for a policy, and they need to be mentioned first. The West engaged in the Cold War in order to defend and promote the goals of open policies and open economies, goals that are good for other countries, just as they are good for the United States and the rest of the West. The negative justifications are just as strong, even if they come in second. If these goals are not achieved, the alternative is a kind of centralized authoritarian state, the return of the egregious rulers that has brought state collapse and ethnic conflict to the continent. The decades since independence are filled with evidence. The alternatives are sharp and incontrovertible. The West can contribute to either outcome by neglect, benign or intentioned. It can allow those African states who will to slide into authoritarianism, collapse, and genocide. The United States has done so in the past, and it, continue, and it can continue to do so. It did so in Rwanda by trying to avoid responsibility, uh, and we saw what happened. By engaging in helping African regimes move towards social, political, and economic pluralism and accountability, it can develop stronger parties, partners on the continent. This, too, it has done on occasion. More of the latter and less of the former is needed for Africa's sake as well as for the United States. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Zartman uh, will field the questions. He's going to repeat the questions for the benefit of the camera, and uh, the program will continue then until 10 after 7. Would I comment on the situation in Algeria, Egypt, and Libya? Um, those situations are somewhat different, uh, so let me talk about each uh, uh, and, and somewhat differently. Um, the Algerian situation is, is, is an extraordinary situation. It, it is no longer a religious conflict. Uh, it is Alger the Algerian situation is a case of terror. Uh, and uh, it, we are far from the situation in 1991 where there was a religious party uh, doing well in the elections and the elections were canceled. canceled. I, I wish that the newspaper people would stop writing articles about Algeria in 97 that have 60% of their content dedicated to 91. Uh, that doesn't happen anywhere else on, uh, that we see articles about, and, and we always go back to those elections. In the, the, in the recent elections in Algeria, there were at least two and possibly three, depending on, on how you count it, uh, religious parties that ran in the elections, uh, and one of them did uh, quite well, and the others uh, got representatives in, in parliament. In the uh, presidential elections of 95, the religious candidate uh, against uh, the, uh, the incumbents, Erwal, uh, got, what, some 30 percent of the vote. Uh, at, but these are, these are moderate religious candidates, that is, candidates who are inspired by religion, would like to have have a program somewhat inspired by their interpretation of Islam, but uh, who uh, do not espouse violence. Um, what's going on uh, is, is a frightening rate of, of murder, um, concentrated in a particular area around Algiers. 
uh, and uh, um, involves probably settling of accounts among uh, groups within the, uh, among these terrorist groups, um, and also involves uh, tactical splits within the, uh, w within the, the government. Um, it's, a, it's a frightening situation because it's, it's uh, even though it's not a political danger, it represents the inability of the state to assure security to its, its people. Uh, Libya is, is in doldrums at the present time, and it's waiting for something to happen about Gaddafi, and, and uh, I, I think there's, it's a very much of a closed society. There's very little that's, that's, that pierces the surface and that's going on. Uh, there's always lots that's going on, but I mean, little that changes the situation. Um, in, in Egypt is more complicated, They're usually considered in the Middle East rather than in, uh, in Africa. Uh, and uh, there's a, a still a good deal of conflict uh, between religious and, and groups and the secular uh, government. Um, but uh, relig Egypt is a vibrant society and more important than, than that. Algeria is, is, is hamstrung by its terrorism. Now, there's a big difference between the two. Uh, Rhodesia is Zimbabwe. I'm, Sorry. Uh, how, how to compare the situation in Rhodesia, Zimbabwe, ex Rhodesia, Zimbabwe, with the situation in South Africa, and, and what is the condition of the economy uh, in Zimbabwe? Uh, it, Rhodesia is one of the, the new generation, the new authoritarian uh, states. And although there are elections, uh, the opposition uh, always gets beat up before the elections, and Mugabe has been in power from the, from the beginning. Uh, South Africa is a democratic state, uh, and, and uh, although there's, there's an ascriptive majority, uh, there are splits uh, that cut across uh, racial lines and, and, and party lines, and it will remain a pluralist uh, society for, for a while. Pluralism is squeezed out of, uh, of Zimbabwe in political terms. The economy is still all right, uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not moving ahead in the same way that, that South Africa uh, is. What's the situation in, in Kenya? Sorry? What? That's what I'm telling you. What's the sit? What's the sit? You, you got to distinguish the question from the answer, you know. <laughs> What's the situation in Kenya, and particularly in regard to Daniel Arap Moy, the president? The basic difference between Kenyatta and Moy begins with the fact that Kenyatta was very bright. <laughs> and Moy is paranoid uh, by, by people who are brighter than, than he and then that are different in their social basis and, and so on. Um, and Moy is a catastrophe, and, and Kenya, which is a, uh, again, a, a liberal state with a Western orientation and a, a, a place where there has been some uh, in investment from the, uh, from the West, uh, is, is sliding down the slope rapidly toward, toward catastrophe. Uh, and uh, we see, we see the effects of the situation that I talked about, a vacuum created around, uh, around the ruler, um, some real thugs involved in, in high positions in, uh, around Moy. Um, the saving grace, which is only half saving, is that there isn't an opposition in, in Kenya. But the reason why Moy was elected in the last elections was that there were three opposition candidates. One of them I couldn't speak. Um, one of them was uh, was I think practically blind, um, and and one of them was uh, unattractive. No, he could hear. All right. <laughs> one of them was absolutely non-charismatic. In other words, the opposition pulled on its traditional leaders. These were all very old figures. Pulled on its traditional leaders, split the vote. The three leaders got a, more votes than, than Moy did, and Moy sailed in with a plurality, not a, a majority. And the opposition still is not getting its, its act together, and Moy is helping them not get its, their act together. And that, that's, uh, that's a recipe for uh, really an explosion down the way. The organization, do we have any optimism about the role that the OAS, the organization of Afri OAU, the Organization of African Unity, might, might play? Um, the Organization of African Unity um, is indeed, as you mentioned it, an organization of African states. So it is no stronger than its members. 
um, and it is particularly no stronger than its leading members. And its leading members are uh, Nigeria, uh, which is, uh, I've described without mentioning it in this case of the egregious ruler and the political vacuum. Uh, Congo Zaire, uh, which is in the act of recomposing itself. Uh, Sudan, which is repressing half of its population with vigor. Ethiopia, uh, which is one of the new authoritarian uh, states and, and is having trouble with uh, ethnic rebellions uh, throughout the country. Uh, Algeria, which has its uh, 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 terrorist problem. In other words, the strongest, the leaders of the OAU are, are not strong leaders, but are themselves highly debilitated uh, states. Um, and the OAU has tried to do some things, but it's, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not in a position to, uh, to, uh, to take care of these problems. And as a result, African states, smaller groups of African states have banded together in sub-regional units uh, or simply alliances uh, to handle some of their problems. Uh, we've seen the, the, the role of the neighbors of Zaire Congo. Uh, we've seen the effects of the West African states in ECOWAS and then in, in ECOMOG, their military observer group in Liberia and, and Sierra Leone. Uh, local groups have taken, I mean, regional uh, constellations, have taken things into their hands with a little more vigor, uh, but still that's in the growing stage. Uh, the question was uh, that uh, whether most poli policies of the United States toward Africa punish the citizens more than the government. Um, I don't think I agree with you because I'm not sure that I could identify any American policy toward Africa. Uh, <laughs> I was at the White House conference in Africa, uh, what was it, four years ago now, um, and poor George Moose, the Assistant Secretary of State, was sitting down the front row. President Clinton came in and said, what we need is a policy on Africa. He was in office for two years, and here was his Assistant Secretary of State sitting down in front, who was supposed to be leading that. We're still looking for one. Um, we react to situations, um, and uh, I'm not, uh uh, who suffers most? Uh, I don't think that, uh, that the populations are suffering particularly, and I mean the, the whole country suffers particularly from our uh, our uh, neglect in crucial situations. Uh, if you're referring to the past situation, I, I referred to uh, the needs of the Cold War, which uh, justified many of our policies and then supported some of the rulers in in countries that you you may be referring to. Are there strategic incentives for the U.S. to uh, take greater interest in French-speaking Africa? I, I wouldn't call them strategic incentives. There are areas where the United States uh, has interests or can develop interests. Uh, uh, and in, in French-speaking Africa, there are areas of investment, uh, Ivory Coast, uh, uh, for example, or, or Zaire, which, was not, which is French-speaking, but not uh, French, uh, former French colony, uh, where there is, uh, there is American activity. Um, I think that you know, one of our popular sports here, when we tire of other things, is to beat on the French. Um, and I think it's important to recognize the, as I suggested a little in, at the beginning of my talk, the important role that, that France has played in, in the past in keeping order. Um, there's a, a good deal of, of uh, 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 tender skin between the United States and the France, particularly on, on that kind of, of, of situation. The French see the Americans coming and they say, here are the Americans coming to, to, to push us out. Um, I, I think there are partnerships that can be developed and there has to be a respect of the sides, but there are, there are countries that are where there is a role for the United States as well, yeah. The United States cannot play the security role uh, or the close political role that, that France played in regard to French-speaking Africa. Not really. Uh, that's the other Hopkins, the one over in East Baltimore. <laughs> I mean, I'm told by my colleagues that, that 
there are, uh, the, the situations are catastrophic, although I, I must say, you know, if, if you like the, the silver lining or the least dull lining and some awful clouds, that the, the AIDS situation, which is a, 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 a an epidemic really in, in Africa, has not uh, had uh, the the total effects that it uh, it seemed like it was going to uh, to have, but uh, it it has uh, destroyed uh, particularly the uh, the modernized uh, younger generation in a, in a number of of countries. The health situation is is bad. I'm sorry. The question was I didn't repeat it. Sorry. The question was what is the effect of the health situation in Africa on on the political situation? There were there were a number of signs as early as the uh, as early as the beginning of depends when you want to start as early as the beginning of the of the RPF the the essentially Tutsi invasion in 1990. Uh, that, uh, or just before then, uh, that the the government, a government of the kind that I was describing, that, that favored one group, uh, that p concentrated power, economic and political, in its hands, uh, was was favoring one group and was uh, was uh, exacerbating the situation of uh, of another uh, group. Uh, I think I made a very pointed remark. I think where we have blood on our hands was in in April of 1994 when the the genocide started. And you may remember that uh, people over in that city over there couldn't pronounce the word genocide, couldn't call a spade a spade, and that uh, that uh, we vetoed the uh, sending of troops when the Canadian commander said that 5,000 troops, not American troops, uh, 5,000 troops that the United States could could get there, uh, we alone have the logistic capability to do that, could have stopped the, the genocide in its early stages. That we could have done. And that's not a clever invention of mine. That's on the record. It, it was a, a terrible mistake we made. The question was, what could we have done in Rwanda? Which I just answered. And then the broader question is, do we have an obligation to do, and I quote, that sort of thing throughout the world? That's a leading question. Um, yes, I believe we have an obligation to do that sort of thing throughout the world. I thought, I was raised in the Cold War. I happened to be born at, at the time when it was, uh, at, or growing up at the time it was coming on. I thought we stood for certain values. I thought we were trying to maintain a position of leadership for some purposes. Uh, and therefore, I thought that when, when the Cold War was won, and I don't think anybody thought it was going to be won as, as neatly as it was, that, that we would have a role in uh, furthering those purposes, uh, both positively and then simply in saving human lives when it took only the furrying of 5,000 troops. So yes, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, I don't uh, have any problem in seeing that we should be doing that kind of thing throughout the world. What is China's position in Africa? Not, not very much. It's, it's, uh, Japan is far, far more active. Uh, uh, China is, is, I think, less active than it was during the Cold War days when it was establishing some preemptive presence. But arms, selling arms. Selling arms uh, Maybe, but it's not a it's not a major it's not a major source. There's so many other sources, sir. Yeah, the question was about a a perception, um, in fact, a c common African perception of the situation in Benin, where, as I said, the 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 party who came in, the the leader who came in, Soglo, uh, uh, after the the sovereign national conference and the free elections, was then defeated by the former dictator who returned, Karaku. Um, returned, uh, reformed, um, at least partially true, uh, somewhat true, um, uh, in the, the latest elections. And that this was seen as a French candidate, <coughs> excuse me, de defeating an American candidate who was a, a technician. You know, I think one of the saddest things in this, uh, in our attempt to understand international affairs, are conspiracy theories. 
Um, and uh, it, it, it's, if you understand, I mean, if you go back to my, my remark about American policy in Africa, uh, which I think is a pretty good uh, characterization of, of uh, how Washington is concerned about Africa, uh, it, it, it just doesn't jibe with the idea that Soglo is an American puppet. Uh, Soglo, I mean, the desk man knows who Soglo is, but, but uh, he's not part of an infinite scheme of things, uh, of the American world order. Uh, he had good relations because with the United States and with the World Bank because he did some structural adjustment. Um, and so then Karakou uh, tried to get some support from other sources outside in, in his campaign. Um, it, it's, it just ain't that way. It's, it's a, this is an affair among, uh, essentially um, among Beninois, uh, and uh, nobody is the candidate of one or the other. But lots of people see it that way. And I think we have to understand when you're a policy taker, when you're a small country in, in, in the world, uh, and you wonder what's going on, the big forces must be operating in some highly intelligent way. Geez, if we were only so intelligent as the conspiracy theories give us credit for, it would be nice. Who's arming Africans for this conflict? Well, uh, first of all, the arms are there. And, and there in, in Somalia, it was a, a bag of rice was more expensive than, than an AK-47. Uh, so they're, they're there, they're cheap. Uh, it, I mean, they're literally around. Nobody's supplying them, they're around. There are lots of arms left over <coughs> in Somalia from the Ethiopian war and from the Ethiopian uh, struggle within, the various struggles within Ethiopia and then the Ethiopian-Eritrean war. Eritrea became independent. They have lots of these arms. They flowed down into, uh, into Somalia. Uh, in addition, uh, lots of people are supplying arms. Uh, people with nationalities, but I think, I'm really not an expert, and one has to be kind of an intelligence expert in this, but uh, uh, people who I think are independent of their states. Uh, there are arms dealers throughout the world. You know, the Russians hold yard sales. Uh, every once in a while uh, in order to, to buy food for the poor Russian army. Huh? Money comes from uh, from what budgets are available. Um, uh, money comes sometimes from uh, other countries with interest. Libya is a is a player uh, in money or in in arms. Um, sometimes I don't know who else. Uh, rogue states around. I mean, Iran does arms. I forget the names of of people that the. Uh, of, of the uh, states with perhaps not a direct interest, uh, but uh, uh, with uh, in individuals from states with, uh, with uh, something to gain from the, the situation. It's a very loose situation. It's not, a, it's, it's not the Russians supplying arms, or it's not the, the French or the Americans supplying arms. It's a much more loose and privatized uh, uh, situation. Um, that's, uh, there's a better answer than that, but I can't give it to you. We should have, we have, there are people, there are armchair warriors, is the question, who believe that we should have troops in every damn conflict around the world, and we should not have troops in Africa. Have I got it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, sir, you haven't been listening to me. No. You haven't been hearing. I haven't been talking about sending troops. When I talked about 5,000 troops in, in the vote in the United Nations Security Council, I said American troops were not involved, were not required. What was required was logistics, uh, the American uh, 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 supplying uh, troops there. And there were troops that were, there were African countries that were willing to send troops as well as, as other troops. I think you've got a position that you can apply to any kind of situation, whether it fits or not that will mislead you in understanding the world. Beginning with your figures, we do not have troops in a hundred and some of the 180 some countries. Uh, check your figures. And uh, we are not talking about sending troops to Africa. And if you would start on the justification of a policy, not with the policy itself, but with what are we standing for, you might get to sounder results. If things lag a little bit, we have a question in, in the audience. Uh, a lot of us would like the two-hour lecture. Uh, we certainly have enjoyed the one-hour lecture very much. It's been a splendid tour of, of Africa. 
Uh, I think we've been educated and we thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, for you to come up and visit with us was a nice thing to do. We're grateful. Thank, Thank you. you very much.